Uh, hello, everybody. A very warm welcome to My Racing Life. I hope you're fit and well out there, and we hope to bring you some entertainment over the next hour or so. My guest today is a qualified accountant who's turned his hand to the analysis of thoroughbred racing through the medium of commentating and broadcasting. He's widely acclaimed for his accurate and exciting commentaries, as well as his in-depth analysis of the sport in general. He currently commentates for ITV, and he's made a, a number of appearances here on Racing TV. He is, of course, Mr Richard Hoyles. How are you, Richard? I'm not so bad, Angus. How, how are you? And I hope for everyone watching in is, is fine, safe and well as well. And uh, obviously pretty tricky times. Yeah, very difficult indeed, uh, Richard. But I'm, I'm managing the homeschooling just about, although many maths questions <laughs> evade me. <laughs> Yeah, maths, I'm, I'm OK at maths, yeah, but as be. soon as we get onto pronouns and yeah, I'm afraid the adjectives and the conjunctions and the, um, yeah, I think my little one might, might be fine at his maths, but he's not going to be any good at art. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, tell us, uh, first of all, uh, why racing? What was the hook in, in the, this sport for you? Um, it wasn't specifically racing initially. My, my hook was numbers. I mean, I've always felt very, very comfortable with numbers and hence the accounting profession and what have you. You know, football averages or league tables or anything that, uh, sorry, cricket averages or league tables or anything that really had lots of numbers in it. And obviously racing did as well. Um, my dad used to watch the ITV7 in the old days and to be honest, it, was a, you know, it wasn't something that really interested me. But it wasn't until you began to make that connection between a horse's form being able to study, which of course was much different in those days. You didn't have form books and computers with everything at the touch of a button. You did have to slog through books and keep index cards and what have you. And once I began to go down that route, and it was also just going racing, we went to Plumpton and I stood by the open ditch, which was then over on the far side. And, you know, it was amazing what looked really small on a TV screen. All of a sudden they were traveling at 30 miles an hour. I love the color, I love the noise. I love the fact that they took off and landed sort of, you know, 30 feet apart. And I think the whole thing began to hook me from then on. And mm. when it became an intellectual challenge to try and work your way through the form book, that's really when I got hooked. And perhaps more exciting than accounting as well. Yeah, there's slightly more relevance to the <laughs> two than might be seen. But I, the yeah. only master at school I keep in touch with is my careers master. And he never, ever at any stage, even though he knew I was mad on racing, revealed that he was also very keen on racing. And he, I keep saying, he pushed me down this route, never told me there were any jobs available in racing. And uh, hence I went down the accounting route, which was, was still perfectly OK. And it was an accounting role that was out uh, in the field doing presentations and what have you. So it wasn't quite as far removed from commentary. Mm as it might have seemed at the time, but obviously it was a massive leap of faith by those that gave me the chance initially for someone who had zero experience of the industry or even had commentating, hadn't grown up wanting to be a commentator or anything like that. It's often about getting the opportunity and I remain indebted to George Irvin and Mick Hamilton for giving me a chance, a chance really. I presume you sent a, you sent a demo tape off, did you, to them and, and uh, were lucky enough to, to get called in. Well, it was, a, it was an advert in The Sporting Life, and I was so naive, I didn't even send in a demo tape. I just wrote an application telling, telling them why, you know, this random bloke thought he might be quite good at it. Um, thankfully, my mum, my late mum's other half at that time, worked in TV and realised and said to me, well, did you send a tape in? And I said, well, no. So we recreated a studio, and I, I did a few dummy runs. And um, after about three races, he turned to me, and I thought, oh, this is it. He's done his <laughs> service for mum. He said, actually you can do this a little bit. So we worked hard and, you know, as I say, I had a rejection letter that crossed in the post with my original application because I sent in no demo tape. And so it was an extra, extra leap of faith, really, to re-invite someone in you've already turned down as well as giving them the chance. So it was, uh, I was very, very fortunate that somebody was prepared to give me the opportunity. And who were your main influences as far as commentating was concerned? Well, genuinely, I hadn't grown up wanting to be a commentator. I knew the voices, but I didn't really know who, who they were. Um, and so, in a way, my influences started when I, when I began to try and do it myself, really. And I went round with a wide range of people. I think the two greatest influences, three really, have always been John Huntley and Bartlett and Simon Holt, just because mm. John started at exactly the same time I did. And Ian and Simon taught me... When I went round with them, they seemed to have the right attitude. They seemed to have the nice, relaxed style. It didn't phase them too much. They weren't overawed by it. There were plenty who wanted to learn everything in one go, if you like, and, and 
uh, you know, we'd drive to the races with um, colours pinned to the steering wheel and things like that. I think, blimey, you know, you put yourself under so much pressure to learn them, whereas these two were brilliant at what they did, but also seemed to have the right sort of approach. And they were the two formative influences, I think, in, the, in this country in, in terms of how I tried to operate. Um, I worked with Simon for so many years, so he has definitely been the greatest influence individually as a commentator. We did 15 Royal Ascots together before Channel 4 got the rights, and obviously I was second to him in Channel 4. Thankfully, we've really remained good friends because there's nothing worse than being, if you like, put in opposition to someone who is your great friend as well as a colleague. So um, that's always, um, I'm pleased our friendships managed to survive through that because that's just a trait of the industry, really. And so I suppose domestically he would be the he would be the one. Externally, I think the Australians were were a generation ahead of us. And uh, Jay McGrath, when he came over here, changed the the face of English commentating, if you like. So mm. um, I think a lot of those Bill Collins, for example, those calls of them, the Bone Crusher, I think our Waverly Star in the Cox Plate is just years ahead of its time in terms of using descriptive language. So they were probably the influences when I started, but I didn't have any influences prior to starting because I hadn't really ever contemplated being a commentator. Richard, you've given us seven horses who've been an integral part of your racing life. We're going to start by having a look at the first of those, which is the Pill Garlic. The Pill Garlic lands in fourth. They're racing towards the elbow. And it's Rough and Tumble in the lead from Zongaliero. Second, Rubstick third. The Pill Garlic finishing strongly. And Rough and Tumble now weakling and Zongaliero. Putting in a tremendous run again. And Rubstick coming there for Scotland with the it's anybody's racing, they race into the final furlong. And it's Rough Stick on the near side with the advantage over Zongaliero, the weakening rough and tumble as they race up towards the line. It's going to be a victory for Scotland. It's Rough Stick from Zongaliero in the national. And as they come to the line, Rough Stick wins it. Second is Zongaliero. Third is Rough and Tumble. Fourth yet again is the gallant Phil Garlic. Some names that are synonymous, really, with the, the Grand National. Rubstick beating Zongolero, Rough and Tumble, and Richard the Pill Garlic back in fourth, doing what the Pill Garlic always did, staying on late. It, absolutely. So he was the horse that got, you know, when you had your 50p each way in the Grand National as a kid, the Pill Garlic was exactly the right sort of horse. He never got a mention until the closing stages. Um, but as you heard from um, Sir Peter's commentary there, you know, fourth in 79 to Rubstick, the gallant Pill Garlic fourth again, as he had been in 77 in Red Rum's famous third victory. And he was fifth to Lucius, so he just missed out. They didn't have for extra places then in my betting shop, at least. <laughs> but that was the closest he ever came to winning in terms of distance in that bunch finish won by Lucius. And he was to go on to finish third behind Ben Nevis in a race where very few finished in 1980. Um, he was a half-brother to Lescargo. And in his young days, he beat a couple of decent horses. When both went on to win the Gold Cup in Davy Ladd and Tide Cottage. So he wasn't actually quite as slow as the Nationals made him look. Um, he finished third in the Topham in 76, but for a young lad who wanted a return in the National, then 33s, 40 to 1, he never did anything anywhere else. He was too slow or he was campaigned in Hunter Chases, so he always turned up as a good price. He never looked like winning, but you always got a return, and so he was the first one, really, that went on that betting slip every single year. Others may have come and gone, but the Pill Garlic was a feature, and it was only one year, that in 1978, when you failed to collect, even though he was actually closest to winning. There's Ben Nevis in shots, uh, winning in 1980. Rough and Tumble uh, featuring again. He was second, the Pill Garlic running on for third with the Stan Miller trained Royal Stewart uh, back in fourth place. So uh, happy memories of each way plays. Yeah, it's, everyone, you know, it's the same time now, isn't it? When you get the phone calls from people wanting to try and tip you a national or tip them a national horse. Everyone wants to try and get a return. It was the one time, even at that age, so I would have been, what, 11 mm -hmm. for the first of those bands, where, you know, you were, everyone was having a bet. Um, my dad was interested in racing, and so it was an extra excuse for sort of, you know, to gather your 50p's each way. It wouldn't have been that much, actually, probably in those days. It would have been 10p each way or something like that. Mm. But an each way return on the pill garlic normally paid for the other couple of losers or another couple of free throws at the stumps <laughs> for horses that had more chance of winning. But he was the standing dish, and I loved him dearly. And he had a fantastic record around those entry fences, completing five years in a row, if you included the, the Topham, and never out of the first five in, in each of those five runs. So uh, even though he wasn't the best horse, I imagine there's quite a few people sitting at home who will remember him and his ilk, you know, the Zongoleros, the rough and tumbles that, that turned up every year and ran well in the national. But he was the first one. He was the beginning of um, a horse that you knew you could rely on and get some financial return from. Yeah, it was a halcyon days for the Grand National, really, wasn't it? Those names were so familiar and synonymous with the race. You add red rum to the mix as well. And horses who 
uh, particularly liked the track because of the way the fences were in those days? Yeah, it was a different race, wasn't it? Mm. Now it is a, more of a conventional handicap. I don't know if that makes it easier or harder to win, because obviously if you could jump round, it was a massive advantage. And we were talking about the number of finishers. I think we had four in, in the Ben Nevis's here, yeah, only seven uh, behind Rubstick. So if you did manage to get round, then you had a fair chance of getting some sort of return. Now you can go out on the second circuit, as we did with Tiger Roll last year, with 20-odd. Mm. Does that make it harder to win or easier to win? I don't know. Um, harder in terms of the fact that you've got more horses that are capable of jumping round, um, maybe not so hard in terms of actually getting over fences. And the Pill Garlic was very, very good at, at getting over fences, never parting company with his rider. I was quite surprised, actually, when I looked back and saw how speedy he was in his youth. He was a two and a half mile horse for the majority of his career. Um, and as I say, he beat some decent horses when he was trained in Ireland. Um, and I didn't, I'd actually forgotten he was after the Lascargo as well, of course, did win the race and won a gold cup as well. But he wasn't, he was more the snail than the Scargo was, to be honest, <laughs> at least in nationals. OK, that's the pill garlic. That was your, your first choice, Richard. Now, uh, you're going to put yourself through a bit of pain now by watching Seema in the Triumph Hurdle <laughs> uh, in 1982. There's a shot of the, I think it was the mistake at the last, there was a bit of a momentum stopper and shiny copper with a big white face coming to, to collar your Seema. They're racing round the home turn now, and as they do so, it's Seema in the lead from Janus in second. Then comes Morton on the inside with Krug, and they're racing towards the final flight now, and it's a long run home. And it's Janus now, and Seema. Seema from Janus, then on the near side, General Brayfax and Royal Falcon improving over on the far side. Coming down to the final flight now, and it's Seema in the lead, being pressed by Shiny Copper, Janus and General Brayfax and Royal Falcon still coming there strongly. This is the final flight now. Seema's going to jump it in the lead. Seema touches down from General Brayfax and Shiny Copper. Royal Falcon over on the far side. And it's Shiny Copper now on the far side who's taking it up from Seema as they race up towards the line. It's Shiny Copper from Seema and General Brayfax. Shiny Copper is holding Seema and General Brayfax. And as they come to the line, Shiny Copper's going to win the Daily Express Triumph Hurdle. Seema is second and third. It's General Brayfax and four came Royal Falcon. And then in a heap where Prince Bless and Krug and Gold Spun and behind Gold Spun was Dr. Steve. Richard's second choice, finishing second <laughs> in the Triumph Hurdle uh, to Shiny Copper. Painful viewing? Yeah, but happy memories in a way. Mm. So I said to you I was anal about stats. So by the time we got to 1981, I was making a selection in every single race and religiously recording how those selections got on in, in my diaries ad infinitum with lots of notes, etc. You realise that if you bet in every race, you were going to lose, but it, it taught you quite a lot. And in 1981, Seymour won four races on the flat, trained by Jim Old. He was a useful flat horse, mile and a half, particularly when it was muddy, loved Leicester, and finished third in the um, King George V uh, handicap at, uh, at, at Royal Ascot. So he was a fair horse. And he went hurdling on January the 1st for the first time, and he, he won his first hurdles race. That was also at Leicester. And because he was a favourite, I vowed that between then and Cheltenham, 50% of my meagre returns that I was getting, you know, with my five and ten pence each ways. By now I was allowed in my local betting shop, even though I wasn't quite old enough to be there. Um, and I was there, you know, whenever I possibly could. Um, and I would put on, you know, half of them. And it became a standing joke. I had this little pile of those carbon. You remember you used to write on the slip and the carbon, it ripped it off. They mm. kept that bit. You had the yellow bit. I had this little pile of five p each ways, ten p each ways. It, I don't know how much he got up to. It was probably about seven or eight pounds, which when you're 15 was pretty reasonable. And it was all going on Seema um, for the Triumph Hurdle. Um, each way, it has to be said. Um, and then in the second race, he got beat. He got beat at Leicester, by, uh, sorry, at Nottingham by a horse called Covent Garden. He was in front too long when you look back at it, knowing a little bit more. But then he bounced back and won at the end of um, the month at Cheltenham. He beat Mary Venture, funnily enough, in a, in a finish on the 30th, and then ran again at Haydock uh, seven or eight days before the triumph, where he won. He was 8 to 13, so he hadn't really taken on much of any note. But on the flat, he'd beaten Royal Vulcan, who was champion hurdle first, was triumph hurdle favourite for the majority of that season. So I did think he had a chance. And then it absolutely bucketed down. It really did on the build-up. And that was something he absolutely loved. He was a bonny little horse. Um, and look, we got done by 66 to one shot up, <laughs> up the run-in. The race was off at 2.15. French was the lesson I was meant to be in. I skipped it, hid behind a wall, which led to the generators at school, had my earpiece a bit like this plugged into the radio and was trying to make the most, or 
comprehend what was going on from a particularly enigmatic Peter Bromley commentary, he could get pretty excited. And sometimes, sometimes I think the accuracy went slightly out the window and trying to work <laughs> out exactly what I'd gone on. He was getting plenty of mentions and he got nailed by a 66 to one shop of Dina Smith. Dina had a really good set of hurdlers that year. She had Janus and Prince Bless, who were much shorter. There was also Goldspun in there. And this was the first picture I ever purchased. There you go. That's it. That is Seema oh. jumping the last when he's still in front from General Brayfax and Shiny Copper. Uh, it was one of a series of four of my favourites. So I'll briefly mention the others at the time as well, because it might stir some remembrance. Anyone remember uh, Rath Gorman, Big White Face, Sooty White used to ride, Run Hard, Steve Knight, Andy Tunnell and Silver Leo winning at uh, Liverpool. They were all little favourites at the time, but it's Seema that stuck in my memories. But most people will then remember Seema for what happened two years later because his star was very much on the way and he'd won the Otley Hurdle on his reappearance the following year but it'd been a long, long time between drinks and then right out of the blue in the champion hurdle two years later with none of my money, I'd learned then not to follow horses over cliffs he of course nearly upset Dawn Run and very nearly upset Dawn Run even when I watched it back there's a moment half, just after the last where you actually think he might win under Peter Scudamore um, and yeah, he gave, he gave that great mare a, a, a real fright. He never really achieved those heights again, but he did run right the way through to he was 14. He was never really big enough to jump a fence. He did win over fences every now and again. And he finished sixth in the Coral Golden Hurdle at the age of 13 at the festival, always with Jim Old. Went through a various owners, ended up in Jim's own colours. But for most, they'll remember him finishing second to Dawn Run. I remember him finishing second to Shiny Copper, <laughs> unfortunately. In that particular race, I thought Sir Peter O'Sullivan was absolutely brilliant. When they turned into the, the bottom of the hill, they turned into the, the home straight. And he said, it's a long way home from here, almost as if a seamer hit the front, almost as if he realised that maybe he got to the front a bit too soon. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know. It's difficult, isn't it? But when he got nailed at Nottingham, um, he, it's a long, it was a long run in Nottingham, those that remember the jumps track there. And when he was beaten at odds on um, by Covent Garden, he'd been in front a while. And I think now, if I'd had better analysis of races, I, when I watched it back, he did go for a home quite a long way out. He did stick on perfectly OK. So I don't think, Jim, you know, it wasn't as if he just got nailed. But it was a bit gutting to be done by a 66 to 1 chance. He was going to get beaten again by another of Dean Smith's horse at Liverpool in his next run. That was Prince Bless, who he'd beaten in the, in the triumph. Um, but yes, you, part of you thought, when I watched it back, he did take it up quite a long way from home, given what had happened at Nottingham. But he did stay, and, and the ground was certainly in his favour, so I, I can't claim he was unlucky, because the deluge that occurred on the build-up to the meeting that year really favoured him a lot. So he had his conditions. Um, I had my each-way return, it wasn't as if he meant, but, you know, gnawing away at the back of your mind was that you were nearly right, but but not quite, and it's still something that just grates slightly. But he was a fantastic horse, Seymour, and definitely one of those that, that got me first interested in the betting side of things, rather than just the, the sort of um, the enjoyment. He appeared a lot in that diary of, uh, of horses that won, and um, I remembered him for it. It's a good job you, you didn't consider yourself unlucky, really, because it would have been... Well, it's a long old haul to now from 1982, feeling unlucky. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's one that stabs. <laughs> you, learned, you learn a lot through those formative years and all those religious note-taking. I've still got the diary, actually. I couldn't find it to produce oh. it. I know it's, I know it's there somewhere. I couldn't, it has pull-outs for the bank holiday meetings with lists of every single horse that won and level stake, profit or loss by meeting, by week, by month. And that sort of really is when my... my I was doing the hard grind that everyone has to do punting wise to learn through stats as much as anything else. And, and also, you know, horses that you, you followed and liked. But uh, yeah, then that era and moving on to the next sort of era when I moved out of working. I was working in the betting shop as a board marker for, in my holidays for a while. A fantastic local family run betting shop where they were so good to me. Um, helped me be in, in the shops the whole time, even though I was still underage doing the board marking. I used to have to go to behind and make the tea if someone new came in, just in case they were a copper. Um, but um, it was fantastic days, and Terry sought me to settle, and Norman, was, Norman ran the shop. Um, and so it was an old guy who used to do the board, and of course I loved the board because it was all numbers, and that was very much my forte. And then one day the, the old boy was taken ill halfway through the afternoon, and um, the proprietor took over, um, to, um, Norman, and then it became obvious towards the end of the afternoon that we had a, a bet that was running up a little bit, an accumulator that obviously was still alive. Terry was doing the settling. And in those days, of course, you had to go on the phone to lay it off. So Norman began to look a bit worried and said he'd go around the back to sort of, you know, try and do some, some laying off. And there was no one else to do the board. So I said, oh, I'd do it. I'll do it. And it was 
best day of my life to that point and I carried on doing it whenever I was in through school holidays and the weekends um, for a few years after that so um, it, they were they were really great times and that's when my love of horses really began to to grab hold through the numbers but then also once I started to drive when I was 17 you got onto the next stage of being able to physically go and that that changed everything really. Uh, another horse who captured your imagination Richard was a Desert Orchid. Well, it's Desert Orchid on the outside of Pegwell Bay, and Pegwell Bay has the initiative by length. Desert Orchid in second place under 12 stone, conceding uh, well over a stone to the one in front, Pegwell Bay, and they're in line for her. And Kildimo's in third place, and two out is Pegwell Bay, but Desert Orchid jumps out superbly and gets a tremendous roar from the crowd. And Pegwell Bay now comes under pressure, and they race down towards the final fence. And it's Desert Orchid, Desert Orchid and Pegwell Bay, and Desert Orchid! Charter Party was back in full. It looked as if it was going to be held. My heart was in my mouth. I don't know where yours was, but boy, oh boy, Simon Sherwood has gained the day on number one, Desert Orchid, owned by Mr. Richard Burridge, trained at Whitsby by David Ellsworth, and ridden by Simon Sherwood. Well, if he keeps doing this, I shall be taking my pension early. Second is number four, Pegwell Bay, and of course, Desert Orchid getting a kiss there. Third horse home is number three, Killed Dymo. A nice commentary, wasn't it, to the 1989 Gainsborough Chase, where uh, Desert Orchid got the better of, uh, well, another of your favourite horses, if not your favourite horse of all time, Pegwell Bay. Yes, that for me remains the greatest national hunt finish because two of the horses that I absolutely adored fought it out. Pegwell Bay, I'd seen him bobbing round in handicap hurdles um, at Windsor when that was a jumps course and at Cheltenham. I'd taken him to my heart. I loved Tim Forster's horses, the Simon Sainsbury horses as well at that time. Pegwell Bay wasn't a Simon Sainsbury horse, um, but he always ran really honestly and he remains my favourite horse of all time. We really struggled to get some footage, so thank you for those uh, people that managed to dig that out because um, Desert Orchid, obviously a far better known horse, I'll come into a minute, but, but but Peg Bell Bay ran his heart out. He was the first horse prior to that uh, same season earlier on. He was the first horse to win those two and a half mile handicaps, the ones in November and December in the same season. I was doing my accounting exams at that stage, six months on doing weekends as well as working. So I was unable to go to Cheltenham to see either of those. And um, I was unable also to go to, um, to Sandown that day to see him running the Gainsborough Chase as well. Um, accounting exams were taking preference, but he was fantastic. Peter Skewdemore and Brendan Powell rode him to those two, two and a half mile. I think it was a Mackerson and the AF Budge in those days. They went through many title changes, but um, he was a fantastic horse. He was one of the fastest horses away from a fence I ever saw. He was really well balanced. He wasn't the biggest, but he really was very well balanced. And he was faster away from the last than, than Desert Orchid. Um, I wrote to Captain Forster to express my admiration, and I got a lovely letter back, um, <clears throat> which was really nice of him. Very, very kind person. I've still got it. And then about four days later, this thing in, wrapped in brown paper arrived through the post, held by a rather puzzled looking postman. And it was one of Pegwell Bay's racing plates, and it still hangs over my front door. So he was my favourite horse of all time. Desert Orchid, my first appreciation of Desert Orchid was when he fell in front of me, the Captain Quist Hurdle at uh, Kempton. He sort of went down almost on, it, um, on his knees, like two sort of skis, if you like, and slid along the ground, leaving these great lines before he... Colin Brown toppled off the side of him. He'd have won a, a street that day. But, of course, he was very good, and he finally laid his left-handed ghost in the Gold Cup, which, of course, was a, a fantastic uh, race um, in its own right. But, yeah, he, he epitomised what you, the class horse and the, the public following he had. Um, but that, that day with Pegwell Bay put two of them in opposition, and just for a moment I thought Pegwell Bay was going to do him. £18 pounds he was receiving, so he wasn't really fit to lace Desi's boots. And Desi was obviously great for carrying weight. I mean, the Tingle Creek was a limited mm -hmm. handicap in those days. He also won the Racing Post Trophy under 12 stone three, it was, giving a load of weight to a decent horse called Delius and won the Irish National under 12 stone as well as the Whitbread under a big weight as well. So Desert Orchid deserves an honourable mention. Um, but maybe in my heart of hearts, <laughs> Pegwell Bay just shades him in terms of appreciation. Yeah, we should mention the, uh, the Victor Chandler chase when he gave £22 to, to Panto Prince, didn't he, before going on to win... Uh, the, the Gold Cup itself in those he heavy conditions in 1989. 
There he is, coming to challenge the Yahoo. Uh, it was a, an attritional race given the conditions. Yeah. It rained all morning, and I think there was an inspection at the track at early doors, but they decided to go ahead with it, and there were, there were doubts about Desi in the ground and, and as you say, going left-handed, but this was, this was some gutsy performance. Yeah, it was, wasn't it? And it was all about guts. I mean, in terms of what he achieved, you know, Yahoo possibly, if Tom Morgan had sat a bit longer in hindsight, he might have still got that little break. But Desert Orchid just dug in and showed a fantastic resolution. I mean, it had been um, a pretty tough race. I was reminded when I looked at it that obviously everyone remembers, sadly, the fatal fall of 10 plus. But Carvel's Hill had come down. He was in the market that year. And the Thinker, of course, um, won the race, um, had already won the race, um, was also another faller. So if you like, it was Desi's opportunity but he still had to take it and the conditions really weren't in his favour. I think he only won two big races left-handed and he won the Martel Cup at Aintree as well. But um, yeah, it was all about resolution and heart with him. Obviously a grey, um, all those King Georges that he used to light up at Kempton. Um, but I was on course for the Panto Prince race. It was one of the few times, I think, in those days when Ascot came alive as a jumps course. It can be a bit remote there. It's a long way away from the action. But I remember standing on the steppings and I backed Panto Prince and yet heart way up the run in you sort of half found yourself cheering for desert orchid really <laughs> and another example of a fine you know weight giving performance the victor chandler it's the first ever running it was all had to be all downhill from there it was such a great race absolutely brilliant that was a uh, desert orchid we're going to move on now and have a look at uh, some flat racing and uh, first up sir michael stout trained pilsudski Pilsudski still travelling very well, three from the left, and it's got a lot of horse making down, but it's going to need it because Benny the Dip, no slouch, and again the former has the edge on them in the Dubai Champion Stakes. Here in cut on the outside comes Lucivar. Behind them, Pilsudski, Bijudan drops away, stir away all over the shot. They've reached down into the dip, and it's now Lucivar for the lead. Here comes Pilsudski, the round the favourite, comes to take the Dubai Champion Stakes. Pilsudski stretching into a lead now. Yeah, he was a truly brilliant racehorse, Pilsudski. He was a, a very good-looking horse. He was with Sir Michael Stout when Sir Michael was champion trainer and he reigned supreme. And it was a, a real vintage year, 1997. And Pilsudski shone through, didn't he, with his successes, uh, culminating in, in one that you will always remember. Yes, the Japan Cup, which I'll come on to in a second. So by now I was working in racing. I'd started working in racing in 92. And um, Pilsudski had... I'd seen, I went to my first and only Breeders' Cup at Woodbine in 96. I'm not a great American dirt race fan, it has to be said, but I like the Canada aspect, and myself and Ian Bartley went, and we saw Pilsudski win the Breeders' Cup. He won the Breeders' Cup turf, beating Singspiel and um, Swain. And he, around that time, it was the first time, I think, that horses were potentially improving their value by staying in training. Up until that point, loads of them were just packed off to stud. But Pilsudski, Swain and Singspiel, all, I think, by staying in training, enhanced their careers and enhanced their profiles. So that was in 1996. Um, as you say, he... he a fantastic horse during that year. He started off off a mark of 82 in a handicap at Newmarket. What a good thing he must have been then in 1995. Um, but then our paths crossed again in 1997. I'd been fortunate enough through the candidacy of Jim McGrath, uh, Aussie J.A. McGrath, to get a job out in Hong Kong. And in 1997, I'd been there for about two or three months when on the build-up to the Japan Cup, the Australian caller who used to do it, Brian Martin, sadly his mother passed away. It was a quite short notice and they didn't really have an English caller who was close enough to go and um, do the commentary. Um, I was the number two at that stage in Hong Kong. I was mainly presenting rather than commentating. And so it was decided that I was going to go. I jumped on a plane um, and went to Japan where in front of 170 odd thousand, I provided the um, each way, I provided the English commentary for, um, for the Japan Cup. And um, it was an astonishing experience. And it was won by Pilsudski, um, which was, you know, a, a massive boost for me because he was partnered by Mick Canan, who was very good friends with Robin Park, who's the doyen of, um, of journalists out in Hong Kong. And um, basically, he, he'd asked Mick to look after me. <laughs> and that's basically why I got a really good interview afterwards. Had he not held on by a neck, things might have been very different for my career generally but it was a massive boost to go out there to see Mick win on Bill Sudsky. great ride beat Air Groove and Bubblegum Fellow the ride won him the race he wasn't at his best it was his swan song 
but it was a horse I'll ever, forever be grateful for, for seeing in so many places around the world. And, as I say, in terms of the fact that, um, that he gave me a very memorable experience calling the Japan Cup in 97. Uh, was the call smooth enough for you? Did it all go OK? It was bedlam. If you've ever seen any <laughs> Japan racing, they, they pan left, they pan right, they don't stay on one horse. Um, I'd made a mistake copying over one of the horse's names as well, one of the um, Taiki Blizzard and Taiki Shuffle, I think. So there was the potential for a recipe of disaster. It was absolute chaos and bedlam. And it was just me there doing the English feed, not really sure what the hell was going on. A bit like trying to set me up for this. I'm a techn technical idiot when it comes to this sort of thing. Um, but it did me, it did my standing a lot of good in Hong Kong. Um, Alan Munro was very, very gracious um, in terms of when I came back, he made a big point of coming and finding me and saying, you know, because I was only young and he started that, you know, um, how well he thought I'd done and this sort of thing. And I, I was very, still very insecure and that sort of thing. So it made, it was, it was, it was, a, a, it was a, a nice fillet, but it was more a, a terrific experience. And we were lucky enough to have uh, Richard Griffiths, who was working for the Racing Post at the time. He was he'd done some bloodstock work for the Japanese paper, and so he had an interpreter. So we were able to go off our own devices. We went to the Japan Cup on the Japan Cup on the Japanese Metro rather than the press bus, and we had we got pictures of form being laid out. You know, I love overseas form, whether it be China or Japan. They're just a string of numbers, but once you know what they mean, of course, in distance, you know what have you. Of the, of, on the floor of the Japanese Metro, this bloke with his racing paper laid out all over the floor with me and Richard Griffiths pointing at various numbers and his interpreter telling us what it meant. It was a fascinating experience to see how Japanese racing was run, um, but also the result was very, very fortunate, really, in making it a world story rather than just a you know, Japanese one. Uh, given your love of numbers, working in Hong Kong must have been something that you very much enjoyed. Yeah, I did. I, I loved Hong Kong. Um, it was a fantastic learning experience from my point of view. Um, you know, when you think there's only a, just over a thousand horses in those days, you think, oh, that must be pretty easy. But it wasn't because everyone had everyone knew so much. You know, it was the era of the syndicates. There were some very, very smart people over in Hong Kong. And I was coming from the northern hemisphere. I was the only POM in a, you know, a complete department full of Aussies. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, it was Southern Hemisphere based, really, because, you know, it's on track training. You have trials. You, it was so different. A lot, most of the horses were coming from the Southern Hemisphere rather than Northern. There were some. And I was just indebted to some fantastic people who took time and effort to explain. I was like a sponge. And that's where I first came across the likes of, you know, Terry Spargo, David Price, David Brosnan, Mark Edwards, loads of very smart people who were out there. You know, all of whom, you, you know, you, it was my sort of degree course if you like I can show you I, you know I've devised my own computer program um, you know I've got meticulous notes over every single race written up like time form perspective with run lines I knew my sectionals inside and out you know um, and it was a fantastic experience really um, Hong Kong was for me when my love of racing you know my up until then my love of racing had got me through my broadcasting i knew my racing well enough to learn how to broadcast this was the other way around could my broadcasting get me through in an alien environment um and i'm indebted forever for people to taking so much time and it, it will come on to something right towards the end but it also forged the most important sort of association in my career from that point of view which was with jockey felix kutsi and um that remains for me you know the the, the, the greatest single um uh, inspiration, um, effect on my racing knowledge really was being able to work with Felix so closely for so long. So yeah, Hong Kong was a fantastic time really. And um, yeah, it was, a, it was a terrific experience. Superb. We'll get on to Felix uh, a little bit later on. But for now, we're going to have a look at uh, Ouija Board who won uh, the Nassau Stakes in that tremendous finish against Alexander Goldra. And Ouija board in the centre. Now looms up on the outside, grabs a narrow lead. Here's Alexander Gold run and race for the stars. It's going to be a two and a half foot long sprint on here as Ouija board the far side is now being tackled by Alexander Gold run. Behind them is race for the stars and they've kicked away from Chelsea Rose. The two great fillies, a furlong and a half left to go. Far side Ouija board, near side Alexander Gold run. Not a breath between them. Four legs in front of Nanina batting on. Ouija board the far side won't give in. Near side is Alexander Gold run. Absolutely nothing between them. They race towards the line now. Photo between Ouija board and Alexander Gold run. That was her sixth Group 1 success. She won one more in her career, and I still think Alexander Gold won one. 
Yeah, and if you look at the photo, because um, I've got a copy at home, Alexander Goldrun's nose, you watched the last stride. Yeah. Um, we may be able just to, to run this over, but you watched the very last stride of Kevin Manning, and I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure it's Kevin Manning. The head just turns to one side, just yeah. slightly. Um, it's almost it hasn't quite pushed through the line for that final stride. And when you see the photo, uh, uh, Alexander Goldrun's head is just slightly to the right. Um, a fantastic finish, fantastic race. I included it because Ouija Board um, had won the Oaks in 2004, by which time I was back in the UK and I commentated on, on that particular race, which was fantastic. But he'd also won a Hong Kong Vars. I'd seen him run in Dubai in the Shima Classic. And I'd also seen Alexander Gold run right around the world. And for the two of them to effectively produce that sort of finish right towards the end of their careers, I thought was just astonishing, really. I still reckon that's in my top five races of, um, of all time in terms of excitement on course. And it was a fitting finale, really, for two horses that I'd been fortunate enough to see right the way around the globe. And um, to, fin to find out a finish like that, I think, was superb. But, yeah, to this day, I always just wonder if that <laughs> push through the line had gone straight and Alexander Gold's run ahead wasn't cocked slightly to the right, whether that photo would have been different. Because I do remember, on course, it was one of those photos where everyone didn't know. It wasn't as mm. if you thinking you saw it and think, oh, yeah, so-and-so's won. Um, as you say, when you watch it live, you still feel Alexander Goldrun may well have prevailed. But it was a fantastic race. Great duel, great commentary by J.A. there as well. And, you know, it was just brilliant because I had so much affection for both horses. You don't often get them performing right to their best in a, in a single race, although we're going to get that again in a minute with our next horse. But, um, yeah, I th that, that race for me was one of the most exciting races to have been on course for and, and two horses which I held in great affection. And, again, Globetrotters, I'm very much pro mm. particularly on the flat horses that have strutted their stuff around the globe like the Pilsudskis of this world I, th I think that's I think that's to their great credit uh, you know lots of people say oh horse racing's bent and you know or this that and the <laughs> other I think it's absolutely amazing you can pick up horses from different parts of the world transport them halfway around the globe drop them in an alien place yeah and they will run to within two or three pounds most of the time and that's actually astonishing when you think about it you know, you know, badly you feel getting off planes and this sort of thing. And I mm. think the advances in international travel um, have been absolutely fantastic in making racing a complete global sport. Hopefully the current situation won't reverse that too much in the medium term. But, uh, yeah, I, I very much admire horses that are capable of travelling halfway around the world and then running their race almost to within three or four pounds ratings-wise of ones they've done in their own backyard. Yeah, Ed Dunlop, of course, who trained Ouija board, is one of the pace setters as far as that was concerned with the likes of Red Caddo. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and there's some trainers that have always done that. Um, mm. You know, Clive Britton, right from those early yeah. days, I remember having a fascinating conversation with Clive about the, the travel arrangements for Bold Arrangement, I think it was. You know, it took longer for him to get from the airport, I think, to Kentucky um, to run the, the Derby. I think that's right. Um, anyway, whichever race he ran in, it might have been York, actually. Um, it took long, longer, longer on, the, um, on the box than it would do now to fly horses right the way around and, and mm. run them. It's astonishing, you know, how difficult international travel was. And when I first went to Hong Kong, you know, they didn't have genuine Group 1 horses in those days, but it was a level playing field for everyone because everyone else's Group 1 horses became Group 2 horses after they travelled, whereas now that really isn't the case. Um, you know, genuine Group 1 horses produce Group 1 form right the way around the, right the, way around the globe. So, um, yeah, Dunlop, definitely someone who campaigned his horses aggressively abroad and, and continues to do so. And there's big paydays. Um, for those that have the right sort of horses, you know, Jim and Tonic Silvano from France and Germany hardly ever ran in their own countries. They would just globetrot and run in those races in Hong Kong. We saw them sort of every year. Yeah, I always remember um, Sayer Datti going abroad for Clive Britton. And I spoke to someone at Clive Britton's yard and they said, well, she's a bit of a fussy eater. She doesn't, you know, she's, she's tricky. And we, we, we got her abroad. I forget where they took her. Um, and she, she wasn't eating up. She wasn't eating at all. She wasn't doing well at all. And Clive said, I've got the answer get a mirror and he put a mirror above the feed bowl and she thought another horse was trying to eat her food and she scoffed the lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's true fantastic. Story. That works with me, by the way, as well. Yeah, does it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I reckon one horse who, who never really missed a, a meal was the tank, Denman. Yeah, I think I've lost you, Angus.
So it's Denman who leads from Neptune Collange. Quarto star in third, Exotic Dancer is in fourth place as Denman is over the next from Neptune Collange. Again, Quarto star rushed his way through the top and Rumi Walsh draws the whip on Quarto star. Denman powering on down the hill, leads by three to four from Neptune Collange. Quarto star with a mountain to climb to retain his crown. Denman gallops on towards the next. He's over about eight clear. Neptune Collange, Quarto star, Exotic Dancer took it by the roots they're now on the home turn and Denman is 10 lengths clear from in second ridden along Neptune Collange Quarto Star trying to stay on to second but see the crowd slipping from his grasp it's Denman facing the Cheltenham Hill but with a big lead it's as much as 10 to 12 lengths and Quarto Star is struggling to even get past Neptune Collange the second last Denman comes to it 10 lengths clear and he's over Quarto Star's moved through into second then in third is Neptune Collange the whip drawn on Denman, Quarto Star staying on, eight lengths between the pair at the last, Denman comes to the final fence, he's over from Quarto Star in second, he brushes through the top, Denman is a tired horse, he has 200 yards to travel Quarto Star with eight lengths to find, but Denman and Sam Thomas driven out, relentless remorseless, has pounded Quarto Star into submission the answer is Denman Denman won the Gold Cup from Quarto Star, who shared the first over second with Neptune Collage. Half on Genolade was four in fifth exotic dancer and nowhere was sick. I think, Richard, in that commentary of yours, you summed Denman up perfectly. Relentless, remorseless, and he was brilliant that day. And it was a privilege, I guess, for you to be commentating when two of the greatest chasers we've seen for a very long time were locking horns. Yeah, I think that, yeah, I mean, I, I always feel privileged to to produce any sort of soundtrack to what is, you know, mm. it's the horses that are stars. We're lucky yeah. enough to provide the soundtrack and witness great things. Um, that was the most exhilarating experience, I think. Uh, just to put it in a little bit of context, I, you forget how tribal it was, you know, Denman and Quarto style with the, the scarves and the fact that they progressed through the season. But from a personal point of view, um, I probably was a little bit more detached than most. We'd had... The backdrop had been the birth of my first son, Jack, and it hadn't been easy. Um, Sarah went to a routine appointment at 31 weeks with um, uh, the uh, uh, health visitor down the road while I was at Lingfield and said, oh, they just asked me to go into hospital for a checkup. And uh, she never came out of hospital until after Jack's birth, about six weeks later. Uh, she had bad preeclampsia. It was a troubled birth as well. Jack was in special care for about 10 to 14 days. And that was in the September and obviously you know we weren't great parents in terms of having experience anyway and it, it you know as a result we probably did lots wrong we weren't getting much sleep it had been a pretty torrid sort of four or five months and you know between the fugginess you're trying to do your job and, and commentate so that was the sort of backdrop on the build-up so I didn't have as much invested probably in it emotionally as lots of people who'd followed Denman and Quarto Star and had opinions etc so they're going out on the second circuit and Quarto Star made a slight mistake and I remember saying it was something along the lines of Denman's got him at it. And the whole place, the whole place just, you know, lifted. There was this astonishing response from the crowd. And I remember thinking, whoa, we've got miles to go here. You know, this is this is amazing. You, you, every word you're saying is getting this response. And then you're sort of it's a bit like trying to reel a fish in, isn't it? You don't reel it in really quickly because you're going to have nowhere to go. Just just keep the rhythm. Just play with it. And one of the great things about doing race course commentaries is the crowd does react. Um, whereas if you're doing sort of ITV, it's fantastic, obviously, but your audience is remote. It's not on track. And this was, this was astonishing. Every little twist and turn, you got this response. And I've never felt so in kilter with a sort of a, a crowd, if you like, and, and feeling their sort of anticipation, their exhilaration. It wasn't a great race, was it, in terms of, you know, the sense of two horses fighting it out. But... I do maintain that Denman, I thought, would have beaten anything on that particular day. I thought he really did. It was that um, Roberto Duran versus Sugar Ray Leonard, <laughs> Rolls Royce versus Land Rover. You know, it's that sort of pretty boy horse up against a, an absolute thug. And, uh, you know, Denman, I'd seen it when he really ran off the course at Wynn Canton on one of those early runs. Um, and to see him progress as he did, I thought that was possibly the most, you know, destructive performance. The, the irony is, of course, it destroyed him more than it destroyed Corto Star, which makes Corto Star such a fantastic horse because he was one of those that 
tasted defeat, came back and was capable of um, pre performing to that high level again, whereas you could argue that Denman, although that second to long run as an older horse in the Gold Cup, I thought was one of his really majestic performances. But that day, that race, I can still remember that whole circuit, exactly what I was feeling, exactly which words I was going to try and use when, but just because of the crowd. The crowd were astonishing that day. And um, yeah, I think as regards exhilarating feelings on a race course when you're commentating, that remains an absolute standout for me and um, won't, won't be beaten, I don't think. And the phrases and lines that come to you um, in the heat of battle, so to speak, are, are not things that, that you, you think up beforehand, that they, they literally come to you as, as you describe the action. Yeah, I know it's a common thing. I mean, you just try and work out what the stories are. You know, yeah. Denman and the answer is Denman. I never really asked what the question was in the commentary, <laughs> if you like. So in a way, that's, that's not great. But everyone knew what the question was because it's sort of implied, if you like. No, I, I must admit, I don't try and overthink things. The reason being is you can try and squeeze them in. The best example I always use is Black Caviar. You may, if you had a pre-prepared line for Black Caviar winning at Ascot and then Luke Nolan drops his hands, mm. you know, you're pre-committed to something that's going to take a certain length of time to say. You don't know whether the horse is going to win by a neck or 15 lengths. How many words are you going to have to use? And if you um, box yourself in by using certain phrases, then it's not going to work. The, the, the Roberto Duran Sugar Ray Leonard thing was part of it. That's what I'd thought of it beforehand. And it's the pounding. It was the pounding thing. It's that mm. Duran used to have fearsome body punches, you know, into the ribs of Leonard who used to cover up. And it was that pounding and the fact it kept happening. And, you know, one R leads to another. Relentless is what he was doing. Remorse is not quite sure where that came from. It's not <laughs> much used word, but it, you know, but the pounding bit. Rishi hates me for using submission for Corto Star because it makes him sound, you know, and he obviously bounced back, etc. But I don't know. Look, sometimes they work. Plenty of times they don't. There's lots of misplaced words at the end of commentaries, which you'd love to be able to take back. But it's the way it is. Um, but I think the fact that I was more detached and less emotional as regards which one was winning because of my personal circumstances with, with Jack and Sarah, that, that made it easier to be a little bit detached. And maybe as a result just marvel at how much people had invested in which horse of those two was going to win. And their response was, uh, was astonishing. There's only a couple of times in the race course you've had that sort of response. Corto Star pulling up in that final Gold Cup when everyone applauded coming down the hill. You know, that was an astonishing moment, really. We've still got over a circuit to go in a Gold Cup. Corto Star's pulled up and everyone starts clapping. Those sort of, you know, rapport with the crowd is one of the great privileges you have, have of a commentator. And that, that day will always live with me just because... It was their response. It was their hanging on every word that encouraged me to try and really use language. Alistair Down imprint, imprinted on me as an early stage. Language is precious. The right word creates the right visual image. If you can find the right word, it's so important. And language is beautiful used correctly, horrible used incorrectly. <laughs> and every now and again, the former outweighs the latter. But um, that's what makes it the challenge, really, isn't it? It's live. You can't take it back. You can't edit it. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think language, if you use it effectively, becomes the soundtrack to a well-loved event. It's not the commentary that's great. It's the event that's great. If the commentary fits. It becomes part of that memory. You'll always be remembered for the poor moi crossing the line as well. I'll always remember that commentary. Celebrates like he's <laughs> won the dark. <laughs> <laughs> And that was, I think I've said to you many times, because I wasn't sure whether he had or not. And I was trying to find a way of blaming him if I was wrong. I, yeah. You know, you're zooming in on the finish. And then all of a sudden, the bloke stands up in the irons and looks at you. And I, as a result, I missed them crossing the line. I'm thinking, did he win? Because <laughs> he was behind when he stood up in the saddle. So you're trying to find a word that makes it look as if he hasn't won. Then it's his fault, not yours. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a memorable experience. Again, a great, I've got a picture of him. Again, that's in the office. I've sorted it through of him standing up doing yeah. that, you know, winning yeah. by about a head or so celebrates as if he's won the derby not no no mention as to whether i think he has or not because no. i really wasn't sure what that had just gone on really but um <laughs> yeah sometimes out of adversity you find something that fits even though it doesn't really make sense and again you can't prepare that if you like and no, you know no uh, your final horse is a truly brilliant racehorse see the stars Tatnam corner now, and on the inside, Golden Sword is the leader from its second age of Aquarius. They've gone four links in front of Kitewood. See the Stars is travelling very smoothly for Mick Canan. Then behind them, Fame and Glory to Boosie, and further back in the field, battling on then is Rip Van Winkle, and Crowded House taken to the outside. Golden Sword now is the one to catch. They race inside the two furlong, and it's Golden Sword clear. Here's See the Stars caught on for an effort. Down the outside, Fame and Glory.
what a racehorse he was. He won eight of his nine career starts and won all of his starts in 2009, including the, the Derby there. Six Group 1s in total, beating Fame and Glory and Master of the Horse back in third place. He was a fantastic racehorse. What did he mean to you, Richard? When I was looking at doing this, I think for me personally, he is the best horse I, I've seen. In terms of what it means to be a racehorse, the Guineas, the Derby, um, the Arc. Group ones every single month from May right the way through to that arc success at the end of the year. There are others that were flashier, you know, win further, your Frankels and they have you. Know, and I'm not trying to take anything away from them, but personally, he just did what was required. He was metronomic. He got himself out of pockets in that forerunner race at, at York. Uh, in the arc, when he looked surrounded, he found a way through. He wasn't one to do anything, particularly in races like the Eclipse, more than he had to. But when he did have to do it, he was capable of doing it. And I just thought John Ox was an absolute master. The horse was bomb-proof. Mick Canan rode him with confidence. And I just think for, for the horses I've seen, that he was the one that fulfilled, ticked every box. So obviously he went to the stud at the end of his three-year-old career, which, you know, doesn't fit with some of those international horses that I've been talking about. But he did go to France. He did go to Ireland. You know, he came from Ireland, obviously, but he came to England as well. You know, so he ran in different countries. He never ducked any sort of battle. And I thought his durability during that season was quite astonishing. And, uh, yeah, I, th I think even though he, he's not one to have won by 10 lengths and as a result get a high official rating, I just thought he was the complete racehorse. He was the one that, you know, if you said to me, you've got to pick one horse to put your life on in a race, I think it would be him. Others are flashier. Others have had better individual performances as a body of work that year. I think see the stars take some beating. His performance in the Prix de l'Arc de Triomphe was truly remarkable, I felt, because he was very keen through the race. Uh, Mick Kinnan struggled to get him settled, um, but he still found loads for pressure late on, coming between horses to win. I thought that was a spectacular performance. Yeah, absolutely. You know, when things went wrong, and traditionally mm. that would have been, you know, it's so easy at the end of the season to think it's one race too many. Mm. And when a horse fires up the way he did, but they don't normally, then you begin to worry that, you know, there's something wrong. Um, and as I say, I, th I thought it was a fantastic performance for him to get out of that, uh, that pocket. So it was incredible. Yeah, fantastic racehorse. See the stars. Now, you mentioned Felix Kutzi a little bit earlier on. Let's have a chat uh, about your association with him, Richard, how it came about and what you did for him and what he did for you. Yeah, I mean, so it's a long, I'm going to cut a long story short here. Felix was riding for a Chinese stable over in Hong Kong and he didn't feel at the end of his first season he'd been seen to anything like his best effect. He wasn't allowed to speak to the English press. He was the one jockey I'd only met socially, but I hadn't really met um, in a professional context. And basically, in order to call at Royal Ascot, I'd left Hong Kong very quickly after the end of the season. When I came back into town, I was one of only a few people there. Felix was there and he was starting out life as a stable jockey for David Hill. So I just jotted down some thoughts on horses that, from David's stable that I knew he wouldn't know, just sent them off to him. We met and had lunch and it became obvious that he had an itch to scratch, if you like. He didn't feel he'd been shown to best effect in Hong Kong. Um, he loved a plan. He loved talking through things. We spent hours and hours walking Happy Valley, walking Sha Tin, talking about the tactics that would achieve best. And basically, it was just a, a working relationship from my point of view that was uh, that will never, never could be surpassed. I know Hugh Taylor, for example, had it with Kerry McAvoy as well. And Felix would ride to the instructions we came up with. You didn't have agents in Hong Kong, but you did have people who were doing speed maps. Where would you land? You know, who should you be looking at? What sectional should you be looking for when you went past? You know, the various big screens. Um, and he assimilated absolutely all of it. If the owner or the trainer gave him different instructions, we followed their instructions. But otherwise, he would ride to the letter. And uh, we had some fantastic experiences, too many to go into now. Silent Witness was obviously a fantastic horse. And having left David Hill, um, he got the job for Tony Cruz. And that really was mm. the one that, that really cemented his ability to ride. I played a small part in it, but I learned more off him. I'll ne I can always feel I came as close to riding as I ever could have done because of um, the association we had. And he was very brave in carrying out instructions to the letter, even mm. when, you know, and we'd sit in the evening, We'd sit and set the videos, start them running, watch the race together, and he would tell me in real time everything he thought. Yeah, we were a bit further back. We said we'd follow this. It was an astonishing experience. And um, his daughter was bridesmaid at my wedding. He remains my best friend, greatest admire, admiration from my point of view to anyone within racing. Um, 
for him. He was a, he's an astonishing man, and we had a great deal of success together, which was, which was really good. One of the big wins, Rocket Man in the Golden Shaheen in 2011. Tell us about the planning for this race. Now, he was drawn wide, wasn't he? So when you sat down and you discussed this race beforehand, how did you plan it out? So we'd stopped working together about three or four years before because I couldn't keep tabs on all the Hong Kong form from remotely. And then obviously I'm now out in Dubai doing the carnival, etc. And lo and behold, Rocket Man, Felix is back in South Africa riding horses for Patrick Crabber, who owned Rocket Man. And Rocket Man, so he gets them out from Barnt Vorster, who'd been riding the, uh, the horse, I think it was the, the guy's name, um, in Singapore. So of course we go through exactly what we've always gone through. You know, sit down, met for lunch, went through it, drawn wide. You've got to get over. The Shaheen's all about speed. You've got to get a position, invest early, go forward, 100% commit. If we're wrong, we go down fighting. If we're right, he is the best horse. Then you can get over, you can travel a little bit wider. It all went wrong the following year when mm. the American horse held Rocket Man out and we got nailed by Krypton Factor. But this was the, mo this was the biggest single pleasure I had of any race, bar one, which um, was Fat Choi together in Hong Kong for a different reason, which we haven't got time to go into. But... This was the culmination of our entire working career, like two old fogies getting back together <laughs> for some remake, <laughs> you know, some band reforming after an absence of four or five years. And it was just like stepping into old, comfortable shoes. And I've never been felt so emotional as that last 150 yards of that Shaheen when it was obvious he was going to win. And it was just the crowning moment, really, of a relationship I'll always cherish. Fantastic. All went to plan in the 11 Golden Shaheen, forced to go a bit hard in 2012, but the 11 will always remain with you. You mentioned Krypton Factor, uh, who did um, Rocket Man in 2012, and of course he was formerly trained by <laughs> Sir Mark Prescott, who you wanted to talk about. Yeah, so he's my, I was asked for a trainer who had the mm. biggest influence. Roll right the way back to when I was doing all those stats and the years when programme books were far more complicated. The years when two-year-olds could win 17, 18 races in a season. Mm. They didn't carry cumulative penalties. The programme book was full of opportunities for those that were prepared to invest some time. And I quickly stumbled across Sir Mark Prescott as a man who did that, specifically through a horse called Misty Halo, who I think actually might have run in very similar colours to the Crypt uh, Krypton Factor. But anyway, um, Misty Halo was a mare who won over 20 races. And none of those races was ever worth more than £1,500 because... If you'd won a race more than £1,500, it would rule you out, I think permanently, of a whole series of races in the future. And I tumbled this quite early with Mr. Head. He used to send us to the Isle of Man where they used to race. Um, and Sir Mark absolutely targeted races with this particular mare. And it made me look at the conditions. It made me appreciate how good placing, how important putting your horse in the right races to maximise their ability of winning. And so we though Sir Mark is well known now because there's less subtlety in a way to our programme for sort of having horses that step up in trip and are really well handicapped. In those days, he really had the knack of looking through a programme, working out a horse's race in July and working out how he could get there with the minimum amount of penalties, etc. And that taught me the importance of placing. He and William Haggis remain peerless, in my opinion. Um, although he obviously is appearing in <laughs> Sir Mark's case. But um, I, think in, I think those two set the standard as regards placing of horses. There are others very good at it as well. The programme book isn't as rewarding as it used to be, but Sir Mark's um, placing of horses remains uh, uh, fantastic, I think, and was very important in getting me to appreciate some of the subtleties of racing. Yeah, ever-present, I guess, through, through your career here as well. Yeah, and he's always happy to spend the time talking. Yeah. I, I spent a fantastic evening with him doing evening stables, um, which was fantastic. I, an experience I can't recommend. It's like a, it's like a show. I'm sure he's got something to say <laughs> yeah. for everyone, but it was a fantastic experience. So, Brilliant stuff, Richard. Thank you very much indeed for all of those. It's, uh, from my personal point of view, being made to go back and look at s some of the races that you've made me go back and look at was, was very pleasurable. It's nice to look back, isn't it? Yes, and let's face it, at the moment, it's, you know, it's all, we can, all we can. Well, Hopefully yes. we can look forward in a few weeks' time, but at the moment, looking back is everything. But, um, look, I hope everyone stays safe, enjoy the trip down memory lane. As you say, one word spins to another. I found myself looking through old time form books for horses that ran behind Seymour, like Royal Vulcan, that I hadn't heard from for ages, or horses that were involved in those national commentaries like Rouge Autumn or Spanish Steps, or horses that I'm sure chime with various people. They are my seven and my two most important jockeys and trainers. Um, hopefully it's chimed a few memories and um, yeah, hope you can all stay safe and well and we can look forward to the future before too long.
Richard, thank you for sharing your racing life with us here on Racing TV today. Stay fit and well. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for watching. We'll see you again very soon. Bye-bye.